Good evening, all, and welcome to this unique gathering, the Oregon Community Asylum Network's virtual auction kickoff event. Over the past year, we have all become increasingly adept at doing outreach and other things that we do, and yes, fundraising via virtual medium. Tonight, in our brief time together, we hope to do all of those things. I wanna begin first by thanking each of you who's taken time to join us tonight. You folks who deeply trust in the individual's ability to make a difference and answer the call to work to make a better world. That's the kind of people you are, people who believe and people who act to make things better. In these times, such work takes a little bit of extra effort. This is because the times are so challenging at their core. Inequalities in our communities and globally persist. And even though we have a new administration in Washington, DC, the realities of the immigration and asylum delays and complications continue. Now, more than ever, OCAN has lots of work to do, and you are here to help. Thank you for showing up. You've already taken the first two steps in helping OCAN and the asylum seekers it serves on the path towards a new future. The first step was believing and imagining how it can be better. The second step was your showing up tonight to offer support for, the, for OCAN and learning about the organization's ongoing work. Tonight, we will hear from folks who have been doing the work for a number of years. They will share with you information about the group's history, its current work, and its plans for the future. You will also, we will also hear from one of our asylum seekers. In these times, when the media offers film footage of the desperate circumstances many face at the United States' southern border, we can easily become discouraged. The current situation on the border has been described as a house fire. Change is desperately needed. Part of that change is social and political, and part of that change is very personal. The latter more personal work is the work in which OCAN is and has been deeply engaged. OCAN helps individuals escape those flames. Tonight, we offer information and we'll talk about how you can help. First, we're going to hear directly from one of the asylum seekers who will share their story and their thoughts from the heart. By the way, for their safety and protection, they are maintaining a degree of anonymity. Hi. So wonderful to see you today here. Thank you so much for letting us interview you. We, we'd like to hear some of your story. We're wondering how long it took you to get from El Salvador to the border, and then how long you were at the border. A ver cómo llegaste. Yo salí de El Salvador. Okay. It took me a year to get from El Salvador to um, the border. And that included being um, held in Mexico for some time. I left El Salvador in 2018, and I had to leave because um, I was being persecuted. I left because of violence directed at me personally, and I left because of my gender, which was creating the, per the persecution. And I came here to, to live a better life. When I came to the border, when I got to the border, um, I, 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 I was stopped by, I was detained by the Border Patrol and ICE, and I was detained for eight months. Because I was held for so long, and I didn't think I was ever gonna be let out mm. um, from the various detention centers where they held me, I felt that the only way that I was gonna be able to get out of detention, because uh, it seemed to me like it was gonna go on forever, was to be deported mm. back to El Salvador where I was going to have to confront and deal with the persecution that would continue again when I came back mm. because I didn't know anyone here and I didn't know how I was going to be able to if I was going to be able to be let out 
le mot ont les And and so when I was in detention, I heard from another asylum seeker who was also detained there that there was a group of people here in Oregon who were available to help and support asylum seekers. And that was how I could find a, um, a sponsor here in Oregon. And what kind of help did you get from OCAN? I would characterize OCAN as an organization that supports people. I would characterize OCAN as a family. I think of OCAN as my first home here. I believe that OCAN is a, is a group of, um, of Americans who think about um, and believe, uh, believe in the community, the Latin community. Well, and what kind of help did OCAN give you? They've helped me in my emotional health, my mental health. They helped me economically, and they helped me um, with my education here, and they helped me uh, learn how to uh, to assimilate here, learned how to learned how to uh, learn how to live here, to acculturate myself to uh, life here in the United States. You have such a beautiful home here. You've made such beautiful gardens. I would say that this uh, this place is my personal paradise. Aww. This is part of, and this is part of the support that I've received from Ocan. Yes, this trailer was donated to Ocan. So she, so she feels that um, that um, she doesn't think of Ocan as an organization. She doesn't really think of Ocan as a group of people. She thinks of Ocan as a home where one can receive the support um, of, of, a, of, of, a, of like a family. Is there anything else you want to say today? Well, when I, um, the only reason that I accepted to do this interview was because when I heard that the point of it was to raise funds for OCAN, um, I wanted to talk about how I felt about that. I wanted to say that if the people who are seeing this or listening to this um, are afraid to donate, that they should not be afraid to donate because we are Latinos, we are Latin, but we are not bad people, we're just people. We're just human beings. And that we are not just people who came here alone, but we are also families who have come here to find a better life. Mm -hmm. And above all, I want to say thank you for believing in us and to remember that you will be donating um, not just to for our, our emotional support, but also you'll be donating to help bring things that people need. There are children in this community that need things, that need things that cost money. And so your money will go to help the children who have come here with their parents and or their mothers. We are not bad people. We are just people who are trying to have a new opportunity for life. Mm. Thank you so much. Muchísimas gracias. Sí, lo único que puedo para cerrar esta entrevista es... I hope that when you, I'm, all I would ask is that you, when you put your hands into your pockets <laughs> to donate the funds, that you think that you that you realize or remember that whether you're Latin yourself or American, we're all just human beings. We all have a heart, and you will be you will be you will be contributing to the community of human beings. Mm. Thank you. Gracias. Thank you, Sue, and thanks to our translator, and um, thanks in particular to the asylum speaker for their uh, seeker for their courage um, and for their willingness to participate in this interview, um, and begin to tell you the realities of what um, they faced. Um, and remember, this is one story. Um, there are many stories. There are currently 15 individuals, approximately. The numbers change a little bit from time to time, adults and children who were seeking asylum in the United States who are receiving services and support through OCAN. 
Um, you can, as you reach in your pocket and prepare to bid on purchasing items on the auction page, just follow the link, which is going to be posted now in the chat. And remember, it's accessible. The chat is down there on the bottom if you're not a regular Zoom user. And you can um, follow the link from chat. Um, and it may take you elsewhere on your computer, but all you got to do is go back to your bar on the bottom and click back on Zoom and join us again. And that link will be there for you to follow um, later um, this evening and beyond when you begin your bidding process. Um, to you can also donate, and uh, we hope you'll reach a little deeper in your pocket, perhaps, than uh, what those items prices may be. Um, and you can donate directly. You can write a check um, to OCAN, or, or you can write a check to um, um, CALC, um, that's the Community Alliance of Lane County, who's offered to um, serve as a fiscal sponsor if you want it to be a tax deductible donation. You can donate that way. And the address also will be posted, the PO box number in the chat. Um, and uh, I ask you to just be please generous and as you do your shopping and your giving, knowing um, that you can help and uh, your help does transform lives. Um, we heard just one example here a few minutes ago. And now we're going to hear from one of the people who was involved in the process of getting OCAN started. So we'll have a, another interview with um, one of our local people who's been involved. Hi, everyone. I'm pleased to have this opportunity to interview Abby Gershenson. Abby's a social activist who's made a difference. Since 2015, Abby has been a volunteer with the Refugee Resettlement Coalition of Lane County and has been instrumental in the successful resettlement of Syrian asylum seekers to Eugene. Abby's also a founding member of OCAN in 2018. She currently serves as the educational coordinator for Signature Home Health and Hospice, providing education and resources to the Lane County community. She's also a regular attendee at Black Lives Matters protests in both Eugene and Portland. Abby, thank you so much for your hard work and dedication for being here to kick off OCAN's fundraising event. Thank you, Sue. Oh, I'm you're happy welcome. Happy to be here. Great. Um, when and how did you first get involved with refugees and asylum seekers? When we were um, hearing about the war in Syria, um, I believe it was around March of 2015, that there was just kind of this groundswell of support shortly after there had been shipwrecks on the Mediterranean with people in those little rafts um, coming over from Turkey to the Greek islands and um, in a groundswell of support in the Eugene Springfield community um, that kind of almost spontaneously just generated. And um, we began Refugee Resettlement Coalition of Lane County, as you said in that wonderful introduction. And it's still ongoing, it's still helping people. It's a wonderful, wonderful group, but I would say that that was the beginning Please let us know how OCAN came into being. Let's see, it was 2018, like you said, November of 2018. Trump said, I'm sending US troops to the border. Why? Because a caravan, you know, God forbid this is so dangerous, 7,000 people are um, walking across Mexico from countries in Central America because um, they their lives are no longer livable there with um, poverty and the um, gang violence and the um, violence in general. So I was very concerned. Why are our US troops going to the border? We started meeting at Bureau Coffee Shop. I believe it was once a week. And at that point, our um, goals were one, to find out organizations that were gonna be helpful. Sue, you were right there in there because I remember meeting with you um, 
then. But first organizations that were helping asylum seekers that we could maybe volunteer with near the border, whether it was San Diego, California, Mexico border. Um, second of all, if we could uh, gather donations and then give them to shelters and um, um, albergues, they call them down there, um, because they a lot of them had wish lists. And the third thing was, how can we help uh, asylum seekers here in our communities in, in um, Springfield and Eugene, the New Sanctuary Coalition, but they were going down to the border and they were looking for volunteers. And my daughter was in her senior year of high school and it was about to be winter break. And um, the two of us bought tickets and um, did the orientation and went down there. And after it was literally only 10 days down there, um, for me, my eyes were opened in a big way. Um, I became truly an activist by what I saw down there. And is it all right to go into just briefly? Um, because when I came back, I felt like I needed to tell people this because I didn't know it. And I thought other people didn't know it and other people who care. So the first thing that was really disturbing that I found out, I was working in Tijuana with this organization and people were coming up and they were being put in these terrible shelters where they didn't get enough food. So we were also working with World Center Kitchen that was making food. Um, we volunteered in various capacities. But um, first I found out that, that they had to wait in these very uncomfortable conditions for a very long time because Mexico had agreed to do this number system because um, Customs and Border Protection and the administration wanted that. The second thing was that um, once somebody did finally get to cross the border, their number was called. Um, they would immediately be thrown in this very freezing cold detention cell. And it was kind of arbitrary how long they stayed in there, but it was kept cold by air conditioning. Day and night, they were given those horrible Mylar blankets. That was it. Um, they were taken out just um, three times a day for very minimal food, basically starvation meals. Every single, literally without exception, every single person who did then wait on the Mexico side to learn number it was called, go through that yelera, they called it, it means ice box in Spanish, um, for however many days, they would then be transferred to detention. So it was from Customs and Border Protection Yaleras to ICE detention. And at that point, they were treated like criminals and they had, the only way they could get out was if they had a sponsor, if they had a bail, they had to get bailed out. And we've also helped, um, I think you said at this point, it's about 15 asylum seekers. And is this- we helped At least 18 here in Eugene in the past couple of years. And then some that didn't end up in Eugene. Well, all I can say, Abby, is thank you so much. If it hadn't been for you, probably OCAN wouldn't have got founded. And um, it's been a joy working with so many people that care so much. And it's definitely been a joy for all of us to help the asylum seekers. Thank you. And thank you for interviewing me. And um, I'm just very honored um, to get to give this talk. And I welcome all of you who are listening both to support us and um, to check in and find out more about what we do and maybe even become a part of the organization. It's a, a local volunteer organization that's, I, you know, um, really made a big difference in people's lives. Thank you, um, Abby, and thank you, Sue, for another interview. And um, Abby, I just, you know, I think that there's this sense that we get an explanation of how intentions and hopes to make a difference become actions. And those actions continue to unfold. Um, and don't forget your actions, your bidding, your contributions of uh, treasure or time can help make a difference. Um, 
you may not be a meeting goer. So OCAN as an organization may not be part of what fits in your schedule. Um, you may not know Spanish or have other skills and time to offer, but you can offer financial support via the auction and the opportunities for donations. Um, and if you bid on an auction, you can take home some lovely items as well. Kind of a bonus for doing work that makes a difference and get something in return at the same time. The link, link is again gonna be posted on the chat. Um, you know, and just remember that the work of the Oregon Community Asylum Networks continues through the years. It's still a very young organization continuing to do the work. Um, we will hear now from another stalwart volunteer about that ongoing work and the direction um, that things may be headed in the future. So we have another, uh, another interview now. This evening, I have the pleasure of talking with Ken Krauss, an active member of OCAN and a member of the First Congregational United Church of Christ in Corvallis an immigrant welcoming congregation. Ken has been volunteering at Casa Latinos Unidos in Corvallis for the past several years and accompanies asylum seekers to check-ins with ICE and Eugene in various appointments in Portland. He has gone on fact-finding trips to Mexico and several Central American countries where many asylum seekers come from. He has seen the conditions that force people to leave their homes and family. Ken is dedicated to improving the lives of recent immigrants to Oregon. It's a pleasure to visit with you, Ken. Welcome. Thank you for having me. What specific support and assistance has OCAN provided to asylum seekers in Oregon? People, especially coming from poor rural areas, often have unmet medical and dental needs. Um, and those need to be tended to, uh, which can be kind of expensive unless the sponsor is able to find some source for free medical assistance. Uh, generally, the sponsors um, house the, their asylum seekers, provide room and board, basically. Uh, but there's also legal expenses once they, once they get here. A lawyer has to uh, assist in filing uh, the application for asylum. Uh, there's court hearings. Um, they have to uh, apply for a um, work permit. Um, and all those things add up. Uh, can be anywhere from uh, five to $10,000 for legal fees. They almost all need some sort of assistance in learning English. Um, uh, they may get connected up with the community college or, or may uh, get individual tutoring to learn English. Uh, if they have children, uh, the children need to get set up in the schools. Um, and it, it's often critical that they find a school that has uh, bilingual support for children. Um, and then there's social needs, uh, which sometimes kind of get overlooked, but are really important. Um, and OCAN has provided uh, things like having family potlucks where asylum seekers get together and meet with other asylum seekers and the sponsors. Can you tell, tell us something about uh, OCAN's accomplishments over the past two and a half years? Fundraising has been a key part of, of what OCAN does. And, um, um, some of it has been through events, but a lot of it has been just personal outreach, uh, people contacting their friends, um, uh, setting up GoFundMe accounts. And it's, it's been gratifying to see how much uh, support has come in, sometimes from just out of the blue, unexpectedly. So it's really, uh, great to see the, the kind of support that people in Lane County have for our activity. Um, another thing that's, that's been a challenge and an accomplishment is um, housing people because uh, initially they're housed with the sponsor, but oftentimes they have to change 
either because uh, the sponsor, something has come up, they're unable to keep them there in their home. Sometimes um, they just uh, want to have more independence. They want to be in a place of their own. All right, Ken, thank you so much. And thank you for your, uh, you know, for the support that you've given to the Asylum Seekers and all your hard work. Thanks an awful lot. Thanks for having me. Indeed, thanks, Ken, and thanks, Ed, for your work, including this interview. Um, um, as Ken pointed out in his, in his, his, well, in the interview, I mean, in the introduction, we heard that um, he's part of a faith community where um, immigrant action and action to seek to make a better world is an act of faith. And that's true for any of us, whether we do that in the context of the faith community, or our own deep belief that what we do matters in the world. And we answer each of us in our own ways, a call to be part of transforming lives. And that's just exactly what OCAN has been doing. Um, the web, the uh, um, auction side is gonna be again posted for your convenience. So check out what's there. And I wanna suggest that uh, even though the auction site will be open and you can bid over the next tour's works at two weeks, I urge you to take a look tonight and see what's out there um, while the stories of the impact your assistance makes are still fresh in your mind and in your heart. Uh, many of you have no doubt um, seen news reports, including photos of what has been going on on the border over the last few weeks and months. Um, some of the accounts I've seen make my heart ache and fill me with a deeper desire to try to figure out what I can do to help. Now we're going to have a firsthand account of one of the most stalwart OCAN volunteers who has been the doing the work of helping um, would-be asylum seekers who are still at the border. Hey everybody, buenos dias. I'm talking to you from the rooftop deck of La Casa de Paso in Tijuana. I've been down here for about a little over a month now and um, time has gone so fast. It's so good to be back. It had been, as some of you know, 13 months because of COVID. El Chaparral is now, as you've probably heard or seen on the news, it's basically a refugee camp and it's um, a block from this house. It's where people used to go to sign up to get a number and wait for their number to be called. Now it is a camp with about, oh my gosh, I don't even know how many people, well over a thousand people. And it's getting more dangerous and worse conditions for people by the day. So it's it's really miserable over there and it is a breath of normality and peace and comfort to be able to come to this house and um, have a little bit of serenity and calm in the midst of a chaotic day. Sometimes it's not quite the same for us because sometimes we have as many as you know, six moms and 12 kids here all at once. And um, wow, that just is um, a lot of people in the house for an extended period of time. But there, all the moms are cooking, all the kids are playing with every last toy we have. Um, and um, it's, it feels, it feels good. The new things are just having people here to take showers and do their laundry and cook food um, on a pretty regularly regular basis. Um, the things that we've always done that we're continuing to do is buy food for shelters because there still are people who are, I think, smarter, who are in shelters, who have gotten their name on lists. We're taking people to the clinic almost every day and buying prescription medications for people who need them. There was one man who lost part of his foot and his ankle brace, some kind of ankle sock brace had broken. And so 
Javier made about three or four trips to different places to finally get something to help him. I think the good news is, is that we have, we personally know four people in the past month who are now in the United States. The MPPs, the Migrant Protection Protocol people who were part of Trump's return to Mexico program. So those are the people who waited, waited, they got a number, they waited, their number was called, they went across the border, they were put into the Ilera, the ice box, they went into detention centers, um, and oftentimes they split up families and they would send um, one member of the family or a couple members of the family back to Mexico to wait for their court dates and then keep one member of the family in detention where some of them have been for close to two years um, in the United States. But any, at any rate, the people who are returned to Mexico um, are the first to cross now. So it's, they get their name on a list, they give them their A number, um, they wait a little bit for a phone call and when they get their second phone call, bam, they are to be at the border like the next day. So you can envision a woman named Anna who didn't even know she was MPP. She came to the house one day to take a shower and I remembered her from a long, long time ago and she had gotten the number and went back to Chiapas or somewhere to wait. She didn't want, she was too scared to stay in Tijuana. And we were talking and I thought, you are MPP and she didn't know what that was. And I got her on the list and um, within two weeks, she got her second phone call and she came here and spent the night. We had a little party for her the night before and Javier went out and got a cake and um, said, Felicidades, Ana, and, and um, she cried and spent the night. And we got up at five and called an Uber for her and got her to the place that you go to wait. And um, so, yeah, she's flying to New York probably she's in the air right now today on Sunday when I'm making this. So those are the very, very, very good things that keep us going. Thank you all for everything. And I want to tell you that it is really important to um, support groups like OCAN because what I know so well is that the struggle for these families is only beginning when they cross the border. Okay. And that's hard to, you know, that's a hard one to think about because they've been through so much. But they need a lot of support once they get to where they're going. There are traumas that will come up that have had to have been just stuffed down inside them for so long. And so many things will be new. And it's hard, it, it's hard for us to even grasp how much what the learning curve is. Um, so groups like OCAN that can help provide some scaffolding for people over a period of time and then gently, but kind of routinely have some of those things fall away until you have people who are independent and strong enough to really, you know, really be successful in this country. Just showing up here is and thinking that you know the work is done once they get to the land of the free and the home of the brave it's that's that's not working so thank you so much for your continuing support of um la casa de paso and um yeah get on the website and read read like little things that i write from time to time about specific families and photos and all that kind of jazz. All right. Thanks. Bye. We offer deep gratitude for Sharon for the frontline work she's doing through La Casa de Paso, which is part of what OCAN supports is that work at the border. And we thank her for sharing again with us the reality that's happening day to day there now. I really was particularly um, intrigued, intrigued by that notion of scaffolding. Um, scaffoldings, uh, you know, go up to help build a building. The scaffolding that OCAN um, helps construct 
helps build lives and provides support as people are building new lives here in this country. Because as Sharon reminds us, things have not are not completed when uh, asylum seekers have made it to, to this country. There's so much, much more work to be done. Um, for one thing, it takes a, a, an increasingly longer time to get those cases resolved. And there's some significant transitions in people's lives and you can help make those happen. I do wanna just um, remind, let you know that if you have questions on what you've just heard, um, post them now in the chat and there's some members of OCAN who are gonna try to get you some answers, maybe a brief one, or they may just, um, you know, contact you individually to see if you can exchange some emails to get more information um, beyond what you hear tonight. And as always, you can, um, you know, follow up with OCAN later, um, you know, and I want to thank you. We're going to wrap up in a few minutes, but uh, to thank you for coming tonight um, and paying attention to the information shared um, in the stories as you increase your understanding about OCAN. Um, and we do hope tonight that in the days to follow, you will do more than just watch and listen and think about this, that you, like others, will take action. And as soon as we finish tonight, we hope you'll go ahead and log on to the website now. Um, and uh, as again, we're putting that link. The need is great. The assistance OCAN has and continues to provide includes help with legal expenses. It also includes helping to find immigrant immigration bonds, um, which is noted can be five to $10,000. Some assistance is provided to individual sponsors. Helping asylum seekers to become independent is always a goal. So um, help provided includes rent and other housing assistance. You saw that trailer and helping meet day-to-day -day expenses. This is needed until individuals seeking asylum can become cleared to work and become increasingly independent and self-sufficient. Um, please bid on auction items with a spirit of deep generosity. You can, maybe you can also just send donations and remember that part as well. Um, and again, through the PO box number that's there. And those checks can be to Calc if you want the tax deduction or directly to OCAM. I mean, you know, and we also have opportunities for um, people to give um, from the um, um, of their time, not only um, for uh, your treasure, because we are looking for um, uh, continuing um, volunteers to participate in OCAN. Um, they're looking specifically now for all, all volunteers who can speak Spanish to work directly with asylum seekers and folks who would like to help children with their English skills. Um, help is also needed um, in, in keeping the newsletter up to date. So if that's kind of things, either of those are within your skill set, those are things you can do to help most directly. Um, there are opportunities um, um, to work on fundraising and uh, supporting uh, the sponsors who are directly assisting asylum seekers. So you can give your time as well as your treasure. So and most of you know the cost of housing here continues to rise and that makes finding housing difficult. Um, and so donation of a trailer like we saw in the video um, um, are still needed or perhaps you have a tiny house or an in-law cottage that's not being used that you would be willing to donate, say, for a year. Um, that could be um, dramatic in changing somebody's life. Or how awesome would it be if someone was willing and able to donate an electric bike? Because some of the asylum seekers are now heading off to work um, and they're doing some pretty long bike commutes. Um, and so that could be helped as all. Well. So there's lots of way of help, um, um, to help um, in terms of uh, um, you know, being coming part of the action. Um, so we're gonna wrap up here pretty quick. Um, we wanna offer a whole plethora of gratitudes. Gratitudes to all the people who have been involved in OCAN and I'm not in, in this event. I'm not gonna try to list a list of names because inadvert, you know, because in, in of course I would leave somebody out. Just know that everybody who's been doing the work 
Um, we have deep, deep gratitude for all you've given to this organization and through the organization to the individuals seeking asylums and new lives. Um, we give thanks to all the donors, everyone who's given the thing small. There are some, also some gift certificates from um, local businesses. Um, even if you don't successfully bid, um, we ask that you support those organizations who have given generously. And if you go into those businesses and tell them thank you for their support to OCAN. Um, but I do want to add thanks for just a few folks tonight, and particularly it's the folks that are invisible um, support. Um, Peter Dragovich um, has been our Zoob interview master um, and helped put those things together. Um, and thanks also to Christy Costello and Shelley Parmalee for technical help behind the scenes. Absolutely, you know, applause to those folks, whether you do it on your reaction button or, you know, more alive. Because in these times, those invisible people make our, our ability to get together a reality and our ability to do events like this. Um, and so we want to thank you. We want to thank you for the generosity that we hope you've given in the past and that you will continue to give. Um, because one of the things that happens when we give from the heart, um, we too, our heart gains um, a kind of massage. Um, so massage your own heart by giving generously to the auction or directly to OCAN. And thank you so much for, for spending time with OCAN and with an asylum seeker and with all of the folks we heard from this evening. And we hope you have a, a wonderful evening. <music>